regular scheduled council meeting for Monday, April 11th, 2011. We're here at the Shaw Auditorium, and we'll start uh, by calling the meeting to order and asking uh, Ms. Harrison, are there any late items, please? Thank you, Your Worship. Replace pages 5051 of staff report, item 11A, Newcastle and Reckon Neighborhood Plan, to correct the height amendment to the medium high density waterfront designation. Delete item 11F, staff reports, property maintenance bylaw 1990, number 370. Add item 13F, reconsideration of bylaws, zoning amendment bylaw 2010 number 4000.488 for adoption. Add item 13G, reconsideration of bylaws, zoning amendment bylaw 2010 number 4000.492 for adoption. And replace pages 27 28 of the Newcastle and Brecon neighborhood plan, which was provided separately to correct the height amendment to the medium high density waterfront designation. Thank you very much. I think we have two items. I think Councillor Sherry has something he wanted to address, and I think also Councillor Kip uh, was going to um, move something. So um, maybe if we can, Councillor Sherry, Councillor Kip beat you to the draw here. So yeah. go ahead. Councillor Sherry. Well, I've got, your, I've got your okay. name on deck. I just like to move. I just, <laughs> I beat you to the draw. I'd like to move item 20 up if we could. John. It's a delegation. Welcome from the end of the meeting, move it up into number six. Okay, second. second. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank Carry. you. Um, Councilor Sherry. To you, Mr. Chairman, we're uh, bringing two bylaws for adoption tonight. And uh, I know at rehearsal it was mentioned what the location of that could not only for refreshing members of council, but the general public. Could you give the uh, civic address of those properties, please? Um, zoning Amendment Bylaw 2010, number 4000.488, is to rezone part of 5547 Noy Road. And Zoning Amendment Bylaw 2010, number 4000.492, is to rezone 730 Sterling Avenue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll ask uh, for an adoption of the agenda as amended. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Adoption of the minutes, please. Move it up and uh, circulate it. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, move down to um, delegations pertaining to agenda items, and the first would be delegations pertaining to the 2000-2011, I'm sorry, 2015 financial plan. Seeing none, I go into the mayor's report, and uh, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome uh, Councillor Greaves. Excuse me, Your Worship. I believe sorry. we brought forward the late delegation to the start oh, of the Oh, I'm meeting. sorry. And I, and I beat her out of it again. Well, I'm still going to continue while she's getting ready. Um, we, what we'll do is... Um, it wasn't going to take that long to welcome him, you know. It was, uh, so, uh, Ms. Melissa Noel, welcome. You okay. have up to 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. Well, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. My name's Melissa Noel, and I'm the coordinator with the Coastal Invasive Plant Committee. And I'm here to speak to you tonight about uh, some of the local issues pertaining to invasive plants in the, the Nanaimo area, and uh, some of the plans that the Coastal Invasive Plant Committee has for uh, future coordinated management uh, within the region. So I'm not sure if um, you had a chance to look over the uh, background that was, I think it was sent out ahead of time, just to have a little bit of background information on the issue. Um, but, yes. anyways. I guess you can put uh, is there one before that? Uh, is there, there we go, okay. Okay, just to give you uh, just a quick idea of what the Coastal Invasive Plant Committee is, if you're not aware. Um, it's a nonprofit organization uh, which covers Vancouver Island, the Southern Gulf Islands, and a uh, portion of the mainland coast. So it's uh, eight regional districts and 32 municipalities. It's quite a large area, but our mandates are to educate the community, uh, promote cross-jurisdictional coordination uh, pertaining to invasive plant management in the region and also help land managers to meet their invasive plant management objectives. That's sort of in a nutshell. <laughs> um, 
So just in a quick review um, on invasive plants. So invasive plants, uh, most of you are probably aware of what they are, but what, but basically um, they're, they're non-native plants that have been introduced here from another part of the world and they're showing aggressive tendencies. So they can establish quickly, um, grow aggressively, outcompete native, native plants or native vegetation and pose negative, impact, negative impacts to uh, public health, to the environment, and uh, also some economic impacts. <laughs> Um, just looking really quickly at some of the regional issues, um, they can pose uh, certain uh, threats to human health. Um, they can also be uh, cause increased fire risk. They can cause damage to infrastructure. I'll talk a little bit more about these um, further along in the presentation. And they can also um, reduce sightline visibility. And you see in the picture here, um, giant hogweed, which we heard quite a bit about uh, in the media over the last year. It's an invasive plant which um, we're seeing more of in the region. <laughs> Uh, some of the economic impacts uh, include uh, agriculture, uh, so re reduced uh, crop yields and crop qualities due to contamination from the invasive plants. Um, poor forest re regeneration can also occur, um, so um, for example, scotch broom can outcompete uh, uh, fur seedlings. Um, they can also have negative impacts on property values as well as recreational values, and they can be very costly to control, so uh, that in itself is an economic impact. Uh, regional issues, so, or sorry, environmental issues. Um, invasive plants or invasive species have been recognized as the second largest threat to biodiversity while worldwide, so it's quite significant. Um, in the environment, uh, the types of impacts that we see are lost wildlife and fish habitat, uh, displacement of native plants, uh, damaged soil and water quality. Um, so those are just a few examples very quickly. And without being controlled, they can double in population uh, in about five years. So I'm going to really quickly show you a few different local examples. You'll probably recognize most of these plants. And I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go into um, the impacts of the plants, but I'll, I'll speak very briefly about um, these plants in the region. So starting with scotch broom, most of you probably know what it is. Um, and can probably you know, tell what some of these impacts are on our environment. Um, currently in the Nanaimo area, there are, and this is taken from our, we have an invasive plant database, so um, there are over 1,700 known sites in the Nanaimo uh, region um, and 621 hectares or more which are affected by scotch broom. Um, five of these sites are recorded to be on municipal lands, but I think it's probably more than that. It just hasn't been any yet. But um, next one is gorse, which uh, sometimes gets confused with scotch broom. However, it has the, uh, the thorny um, leaves. And uh, it, it's actually, once it establishes, it's, it's actually harder to control than scotch broom. Um, I can't go into too much detail about it. But uh, scotch or gorse is not quite as widespread as scotch broom. Scotch broom has pretty much um, made its way up through Vancouver Island to the northern tip, whereas gorse is more right now is still sort of focused more on the southern end of Vancouver Island and we're really trying to prevent it from spreading up like Scotch Broom has. Uh, Daphne or Spurge Laurel, this one sometimes gets confused with uh, Rhododendron because it does sort of have similar qualities, it's got the waxy leaves and it's, uh, it's an evergreen shrub. Uh, one of the issues with Daphne is that it grows in, um, it's, it's, it grows in open areas but it's also shade tolerant so it's a threat to forested areas as well as um, disturbed sites, roadsides and meadows. Um, see quite, of this, quite a bit of this around. Um, we have about 263 hectares or over that known within the Nanaimo area and about 47 sites. Knotweeds, there are four different types of knotweeds. Uh, giant knotweed, Japanese knotweed, Bohemian knotweed and, knotweed and Himalayan knotweed. Some of you might not have seen this before, but it uh, is most easily recognized by the hollow, uh, hollow canes and sort of the big elephant ear type leaves. Some people call it elephant ear bamboo. 
so thank you. One of the biggest uh, issues that we're having with knotweed is the fact that it is a huge threat to our coastal waterways. So these pictures are taken from uh, Cowichan River. In 2005, it was first identified on the river, along the river system, and now there are over 100 sites recorded on the river. Um, that's just one example on Vancouver Island, and it's really popping up in other river systems throughout Vancouver Island and um, having detrimental impacts on fish habitat. Another issue with knotweed is the fact that it can grow through concrete as shown in these pictures. So it can be a, a, a cost to taxpayers, a, talk, a cost to um, different agencies managing uh, roadways and such. And it's also a sight line issue. Giant hogweed, which we saw a picture of earlier, sometimes referred to as a Disneyland plant because it grows up to six meters tall, uh, also popping up more in the area. Uh, one of the biggest issues with this plant is the fact that it can cause uh, severe burning and blistering to your skin if you come into contact with the sap. And so uh, it's, a, it's a health issue and it's also an issue for different environmental reasons. It takes over in riparian areas. French Creek is probably the biggest, the epicenter of giant hogweed on Vancouver Island. So we have about 113 sites and about 14 hectares of giant hogweed within the Nanaimo area alone. Um, some of these sites, uh, there's, there's one site on municipal land and then f several sites on private lands as well. Most of this is in the French Creek area though. Garlic mustard is probably a plant that you may, well, you may not have heard of before. It's a provincial, provincially uh, EDRR, which is early detection rapid response. So it's, a, it's a, a plant of provincial concern and it's just shown up here on Vancouver Island in 1998 in Mount Doug Park and we're really on the lookout for it in other areas of Vancouver Island. There's only 13 sites known in the province right now. So uh, that's one plant that we're really trying to focus our efforts on and trying to eradicate before it actually establishes. <laughs> This, this curve here just sort of gives you, um, this is sort of the strategy that we work on, and it basically shows that detection and prevention make the most sense from a monetary, environmental, and an effecti effectiveness perspective. So if we can catch these plants early on in the introduction or early detection stage, we can save a lot of costs, we can save a lot of impacts, and we can also um, deal with the problem before it becomes irreversible. And this very uh, briefly, this shows some of the costs of what, what some of these plants can cost uh, people if nothing is done. So at the top you see Eurasian water milfoil, which is an aquatic invasive plant. In 2008 cost Canadians about $1 million in damages and in two, 2020, if nothing is done, it's projected to fivefold to $5 million. So that just gives you a some sort of an idea of how doing nothing can actually uh, cause ex exponential costs. Okay, so this is, uh, we, the, the CIPC put out an invasive plant management strategy in 2010. This just sort of highlights some of the principles of this strategy. So we're really emphasizing our efforts on prevention. Um, that can be done through education and awareness and training and speaking with different land agencies. Also, um, we really want to recognize that there are financial limitations. We can't do it all, so we're going to focus our efforts where our chances for success are the highest. We're also going to fo focus our efforts where, where there are high value sites, so protected areas, ecological reserves, um, sensitive ecosystems, and also focus our efforts on invasive plants which pose the highest ecological economic and health risks. We also want to, our, one of our goals is to really develop different regional programs which ad address the local issues because we have such a big area and each of our regions has different invasive plants that are really affecting them and also coordinate these management efforts. Uh, so here are a few different options. There's, there, there are regulatory and then there are non-regulatory options for local governments um, to take with invasive plants. I think that we might have skipped 
did we skip one? There we are, okay. So just in terms of non-regulatory, that sort of, that would include uh, prevention through education and awareness, through staff training, and also through the different vectors of spread, so contaminated soils, gravel, for example. Um, landowner incentives, so um, this is more in terms of management. Some, some local governments will um, uh, put in place different cost share programs, for example, or waive disposal tipping fees for noxious weeds to help landowners out with, with managing invasive plants on their property. And then in terms of management, there's inventorying and then planning and prior prioritizing how you're going to go about uh, dealing with the invasive plants that you have and then treating them, so that can be done through various means. Uh, regulatory enforcement. So there's different uh, different types of enabling legislation that have been uh, used with different local governments. There's the adopt uh, adopting the Weed Control Act. So that's a provincial act which has about 44 different species listed on it, and that can be uh, adopted by local governments. And actually, there's a grant that uh, was in, in past available through the Ministry of Agriculture and Lands to help local governments with enforcement. Enforcement. Um, not sure if that's going to be continuing, though. <laughs> uh, the other one is the Local Government Act, which is more applicable to regional districts. And then the third one is the, the Community Charter, which is um, relevant for municipalities. Uh, it's an invasive plant not bylaw, which, for example, could be uh, an unsightly premises bylaw, which includes a component for invasive plants, or one that more focuses on the environment, or one that could focus on activities in relation to a business. Um, so those can have different focuses depending on what the objectives are. Um, and they're more relevant to urban settings. I've also got, uh, I can, I'm happy to provide, this is the lo this is all coming out of this local government toolkit which just came out from uh, the Invasive Plant Council of BC and it has all this information in it um, and I'm happy to provide copies to anyone who's interested. <laughs> I'm kind of changing gears here, so talking about partnerships. Um, we're, we're really um, encouraging partnerships and working on partnerships ourselves. Um, some of the reasons why it's better to work uh, in a coordinated fashion across different land agencies is because we have, um, it's more cost effective overall. We can recognize problems uh, quicker and we can uh, respond to them quicker. We have better access to invasive plant managers, specialists and approaches for management as well as better access to funding when working regionally. We can also help to um, reduce the costs overall for each part, all the parties involved. Uh, it's also better management, so the overall invasive plant management that occurs is more effective when you work together. You're not just treating invasive plants on one side of the fence and ignoring those on the other side of the fence. Um, the resources that are available are coordinated regionally, so those could be staff resources or other resources. Um, and the, the training, education, and management that occurs is more consistent overall, less duplication of efforts, and we're able to prioritize um, within that region. Um, some of the services that the CIPC offers to all sorts of different agencies, including um, to lo local governments, are um, different invasive plant programs such as public education, um, provincially standardized training for staff, as well as inventory and control. So that would involve planning, project management and delivery. Um, we also uh, liaise with different uh, and report back on different programs that are occurring across the province and other parts of Vancouver Island and we're also able to help leverage funds and operate on more of a flexible structure. Uh, some of our current partnerships include the Ministry of Transportation, uh, the new Ministry of Min Forest Lands and Natural Resource o Operations, uh, BC Hydro and Fortis. Some of the work that was completed in Nanaimo or in the, sorry, the, the greater Nanaimo area in the last two years include um, this sort of gives a tally on this on the on the screen here of some of the sites. So we've mechanically treated about 133 sites, um, used chemical treatment on about 10 sites, and that would have been stem injection for knotweed, and then inventoried about 444 sites. 
Uh, most of that work was done through the corrections crews. You've probably seen them on the side of the road. Um, the hot spots crew, which w crews, which we've had a few of over the last two years, and they've worked across different land jurisdictions. And uh, also we've had our own contractors out doing work, more targeted work. Um, now here, this brings me to... Oh, let me back up quickly. This is a very busy slide and I won't go through it, but this is our uh, proposed work plan for 2011 and the different partners that we are um, inclu or including into this work plan. Some of them are conf confirmed, some of them are not confirmed. This area covers central to northern Vancouver Island, several regional districts and local governments, as well as utility companies and provincial government, which is uh, supplying some funding. And then there's uh, our, our work plan, which is below, which sort of describes the type of um, focus that we're going to be taking. And I have copies of this that I've brought along that I can pass out. We don't really have time to go through it. <laughs> So just to sort of wrap up here, um, invasive plants don't know boundaries, so they can grow across different jurisdictions. The impacts of invasive plants are very diverse. It's not just one agency's problem. It's all agencies, well, all agencies who have a mandate to manage lands are affected. The costs are gonna continue to increase and opportunities to control them are gonna decrease over time if nothing's done. Uh, it's, been, it's been recognized that pooling whatever resources we have and coordinating management does improve overall management and capacity, and we do need to be strategic about it. We can't do it all. So at this point, I'd like to request that the City of Nanaimo considers uh, future, in future, partnering with the CIPC on the delivery of coordinated invasive plant management programs in the Nanaimo area. And that is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. We do have some questions. Very, very interesting. Um, first question, Councillor Patchy. Thank you, Worship. Thank you, Ms. Noel. Very informative. <laughs> um, how things change. When I was a young boy and grew up in the Netherlands, Scots broom was on the protected species list. <laughs> Th things have changed. Um, <laughs> do, I, do I get from your presentation that it is probably better to concentrate on this on a regional basis rather than municipalities on their own since there are no boundaries for the species? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so the, are you going to the regional district of Nanaimo and making I am tomorrow night. Yep, okay, <laughs> very good. Yeah. And then one final follow-up, if I may. Um, at one point in your presentation, you had an option uh, to get rid of this stuff by grazing. Who grazes what? By grazing? Yes. Oh, that must mean at the beginning when we Are we talking picnic goats or what? <laughs> Some people do use targeted grazing with certain invasive plants. That's not something that we've... Um, employed ourselves, but other people have. So yeah, that would be, for example, people use sheep to control knapweed because they can actually break down the seeds when they digest it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Council Holder. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thank you. Very interesting presentation. <laughs> have you been um, uh, in contact with or working with uh, our park staff at all on this? Uh, I do Public have works. one of my one of the directors with the CIPC is Rob Lawrence. Yeah. So he he's sort of my main point of contact with the city of Nanaimo. I haven't had as much um, involvement with the city park staff, like people who are on the ground. I would like to though. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Yes, because I, I know we've had uh, programs, uh, or at least uh, efforts to control certain species as well in the parks and so on. Yeah. And uh, maybe if I could just ask uh, mm -hmm. through you, Your Worship, to staff, if uh, uh, the request is to uh, partner with this organization, uh, do staff have any comment on that? Mayor Rattan, through Councillor Holdem, I think it is a good idea that we partner with um, the Coastal Invasive Species Program. It will provide us with some leverage as well as look at a regional basis. And just on that point, I think Council and the Parks, Rec and Culture Commission has been looking very forward thinking on, you know, on this uh, invasive species because you have passed an urban forestry plan and a horticultural strategy which has enabled the city to do some work in this area. And if we can partner some more, that would be really effective. Thank you. Councilor Unger. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I too am 
very impressed. Uh, I'd like to know a little more about your organization. Uh, who is it, how did it come about, and uh, what is the funding support? I saw your applications, but is there any other, do you get any uh, other funding from elsewhere? Mm -hmm. So we receive funding from uh, various organizations, uh, quite quite a significant amount over the past since we established in 2005 has been through the province. Uh, Ministry of Agriculture and Lands provides an annual grant to sort of cover our, our base operating costs, uh, as well as the other ones which I mentioned in the in the slideshow earlier. Uh, those are pretty much the the main. That's pretty much our main source of funding. We also had a two-year job opportunity program which was uh, through the Invasive Plant Council of BC, which is the provincial organization, and that was a joint federal-provincial incentive, which we did receive funding from over the last two years to implement coordinated invasive plant management. I noticed uh, Hydro and Fortis Terrison on there. Yeah. Is that for their rights of way or? Yes. Yeah. And five thousand to six thousand dollars. That's for this area. Oh, so, I see. Because okay. we we have to split it up yeah. amongst yeah. all of our area, and so okay, it's that yeah, it's not uh, a huge amount though. Also, since I have allergies to broom, <laughs> and the highways department was intentionally growing it for many years along our roadways, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, they had no intention of stopping when they were contacted, uh, arguing that they now had a non-allergenic broom. Is that also an invasive species? I'm not sure what type of broom that would be. <laughs> I would like to know, too. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so you're not familiar with that. No, I'm, I'm just interested in that because yeah. they've grown tons and tons and tons of that. If we convince people it was good to smoke, it might be gone in a hurry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next speaker, thank you very much, Councillor Unger, um, is uh, Councillor Johnson, and she also is chair of the Parks and Recreation Culture Commission. So, uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, no. Oh, you're not leaving yet. I'm, you got I'm one of the... Uh, the uneducated people, actually. I should, I should have been on Parks Recreation Culture years ago because we are now finally, with volunteers in the park, working very hard to control some of the invasive species. Okay. But uh, brochures that uh, that identify those species would be very, very helpful to, mm -hmm. to perhaps insert in uh, our leisure guides so that everybody in the community can be aware of what is invasive. I'm one of the guilty ones that's, uh, uh, that have uh, transplanted um, the ones that look like rhododendrons, yeah. Daphne in my yard. Yeah. And I, uh, tonight I learned that I have a, a plant growing in my yard that I've also uh, planted, that uh, ground cover, that green and white ground cover. Oh, the periwinkle? Thing. Yeah, the yeah. periwinkle. Like so there you go. Yeah. So thank you very much for yes, coming. you're welcome. In. We do have brochures, and I'm happy to provide mm -hmm. the city of Nanaimo with some. I know Rob got a whole bunch. Great. So I've got some back. gardening to do. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Is your time okay? We've got two more questions for you. Great. Are you all right? Because yes, I know you're I'm trying totally to get away fine. tonight. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Besser. Thank you, uh, thank you for your presentation. Just a couple of questions. Uh, NALT, have you connected with NALT uh, whatsoever relative to your findings and any um, participation or cooperation? We, I have connected with NALT. Uh, probably the last time was last year when we were doing our uh, strategy open houses. Uh, so I haven't since been in contact with them, but we do sort of correspond. We haven't done any management, any coordinated management together as of yet, but that's uh, another group that I'm hoping to approach and okay. talk to you about that. And just as it relates to your yeah. funding on that spreadsheet that you had there, um, a busy spreadsheet, and I'm yeah. just curious about the e and Railway and the um, uh, the paths, if you will, between the e and Railway and the highways. Yeah. Is that a significant area of coverage in your um, report for the various brooms and so on? Is it a significant? Well, it, it's it's a it's definitely. I know that there are 
invasive plants identified on those corridors because that's where the invasive plants do tend to grow is along corridors like that. So it would be part of the it would be part of the management plan. And the, the reason the reason if I, you, your worship, that I ask that question is because I'm just curious about the amount of funding that you receive mm -hmm. and if the amount of funding is somewhat um, in correlation or specific to those uh, high profile corridors. Okay. So uh, what we would do with I'm funding... I'm not challenging you at all. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. That's a good question. What we would do with uh, funding received from different um, agencies is whatever they contribute, we focus that funding towards the lands that they manage. So if, um, I guess ENN Railway is managed differently, I guess, in different areas. <laughs> It would be cross-jurisdictional. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, sort of cross-jurisdictional, and it would depend on where the sites, invasive plant sites are and, and who the funders are as to how much Council work Holders you can actually do. Contact with, uh, okay. It would be Southern yeah. Rail. Southern Rail. Yeah, Southern Rail. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Oh, we can hope switch that. in turn with the that. funding agency. In effect, should be, should be a funding yes. agency. Yes, good Thank point. You. Thank so, you. Okay. Uh, that was my point. Okay, Thank we you. have the last question is Councillor Kip. Thank you, uh, uh, Melissa. Thank you very much. I appreciate the work you do. Um, the City of Nanaimo, I just wanted to notice on one of your slides you talked about the chemical eradication that you did. Uh, we've recently passed a pesticide bylaw that comes into effect in Nanaimo, and people will still be allowed to use chemicals in the event that there is a massive pesticide outbreak, but we mm -hmm. do use an integrated pest management structure in Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. I know our own Parks and Recreation uses hardly any chemical solutions now. It's mostly pulling, eradicating, by hand methods and that or mechanical methods. So I appreciate the work you do and um, I think that we should partner a regional strategy for this. It is multi-jurisdictional. There is no borders to it and we have to work together on this one. Might be a good starting point to get more government working together. Thank mm -hmm. you. Great. And I'd like to move recede if there's no other questions. No, no. All those in favor? Uh, Mr. Wallace, thank you very much as well for attending. That's all the questions that we have and uh, very, very informative. And I think uh, if you have any data that you can leave with staff, yes. Mr. Hickey on the end would be thrilled to look after it for us. Okay, so I can leave handouts and data with you. Okay, perfect. Please, if every material you can leave. It's a wonderful program and it's one we all have to get behind or else we're going to have to yeah. machete our way into our house soon. So, uh, But thank you very much. I okay. appreciate your time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, now it's going into the Mayor's report, and so I will again start on welcoming Councillor Greaves, who is still here, and uh, thank you, Councillor Greaves. <laughs> um, the, uh, anyway, this is uh, your first Council meeting, so uh, on behalf of all of the Council, we want to say welcome, and we want to... Uh, you're trying to finish me off early, I can see. Anyway, um, it's a big challenge, and I know you're up for it, and uh, we wish you all the best. And I tell you, everyone here on Council is here to help you in any way they can, so welcome. Another quick little thing I just want to mention is um, I'm very, very pleased that uh, most of us know the VIU strike. I, I, I don't know that I can use the word as strongly as settled, but I think um, there's some very significant progress made, and at this stage it seems like uh, there is a bit of a cooling off period. Certainly I think it's going to be uh, operating fully until fall, and then we're hoping that uh, by September uh, a firm agreement will be in place. But uh, to um, Dr. Nielsen and, and certainly all the instructors at, at VIU, um, we want to say that uh, we appreciate uh, that the issue was in a very, very complex and important one, and uh, I want to just thank everyone on both sides that took the time to become involved and negotiate a successful end of it to this point, because uh, education is something we can't do without, and uh, it's getting to the critical stage where there were people who were going to uh, lose a great deal more than money if they weren't able to conclude their classes, so uh, a big thank you to everyone involved of the IU settlement. Proclamations. Um, <laughs> I'll take about an hour and a half and I'll run through them. Um, the proclamations uh, we have uh, first at the month of April, the safe digging month in the city of Nanaimo. Does Fortis know about that? 
uh, well, that's a good note. You might make a note to Fortis. Um, that 2011 April 24th to 2011 May 1st is uh, Beta Sigma Phi Week in the city of Nanaimo. That uh, 2011 April 25 is Parental Alienation Awareness Day in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 April 25 to 2011 April 29 is Administrative Professionals Week in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 April 28th is the National Day of Mourning for workers killed and injured on the job uh, here in the city of Nanaimo. Um, and it's obviously not simply related to uh, employees for the city. The uh, that 2011 April 30 to 2011 May 7 is Nanaimo Children's Book Week in the city of Nanaimo, and there's a, a big event to be scheduled around that. That the month of May is Vision Health Month, and 2011 May 26th is Shades of Fun Day in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 May 01 is the Walk for Kids uh, Help Phone Day in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 May 1st to 2011 May 7th is Hospice Palliative Care uh, Week in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 May 1 to 2011 May 7 is North American Occupational Safety and Health Week in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 May 1 to 2011 May 7 is Drinking Water Week in the city of Nanaimo. That 2011 May 02 to 2011 May 08 is Elizabeth Fry Week in the city of Nanaimo. And that uh, 2011 May 9th to 2011 May 16th is Public Art Week in the city of Nanaimo. And that's all the proclamations. Uh, we'll move into commission reports. Um, we're into 9A on our uh, schedule here. Nanaimo Athletic Commission, minutes of the meeting held January 11th, 2000, I'm sorry, 2011, January 26th. Commission recommendation that council receive the minutes of the Nanaimo Athletic Commission meeting held 2011, January 26th. Move the commission's recommendation. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, continued Parks and Recreation Culture Commission minutes of the meeting held 11th January. Uh, 2011, I'm sorry, January 26th, Commission Recommendation and Council received the minutes of the Parks and Recreation and Culture Commission meeting held January 26, 2011. Commission's Second. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, moving to committee reports, Grants and uh, Advisory Committee, 2011 Grants Advisory Committee recommendation. The committee recommendation that Council deny uh, another grant to uh, applicant 0G02, OG02, I'm sorry, uh, the Nanaimo Empire Days Celebration Society. Moving into uh, staff. Your, your Worship, yes. may I speak to that? You certainly can. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, your Worship, my very diligent committee uh, denied this uh, application on the grounds that primarily there wasn't enough money in the grants advisory account, uh, as well as the um, they did they were requested last year to apply to the cultural committee for funding which they missed the deadline for this year your worship as well um, the co the committee counseled them to please look at other ways or to investigate other ways that they may be able to uh, to um, raise some funding. funding but having said that your worship um, they've been under uh, quite a bit of stress of late uh, they've had to revamp their committee um, uh, mr. Ron Hopper whom we all know has come back to uh, chair that committee um, he had retired from doing so but he's back in that chair again and he wasn't aware of the deadline for the cultural committee grant um, also they've uh, the HST has uh, hit them quite hard and they had to completely rebuild their float this year they've traveled uh, over 1500 kilometers um, promoting Nanaimo as a destination for tourism and special events and um, in, in, this, in the uh, support of volunteerism, Your Worship, I would really like to see us do, have some support for this organization. This will be their 144th year as an Empire Day Society, uh, the longest festival society in, in Canada. And I think that we owe them and, and the uh, society some obligation to at least try to salvage the uh, organization for this 
this year until they can apply properly to the cultural committee next year is, is the proper place where they should be going. So I would like to move on behalf of uh, council, if I may, your worship, that we grant the society $6,000 this year. Um, their budget is uh, $27,000 for overall uh, funding and they, they only have 21000 in the coffers. So if we were able to assist them in the amount of $6,000, it would help them this year. That's for 2011. For 2011. So I'd like to move that uh, the commission support this uh, grant in the amount of $6,000 to be taken from council contingency, Your Worship. Okay. It's moved, moved and seconded. Um, Councillor Kip. Just a clarification. Um, did you say that council supports it or the commission needs to support it? So it's straight to us. I think she meant council. Thank you. That's fine. I support them. Okay. No. Oh, one question here. Council Sherry. To you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when the committee uh, reviewed their budget, uh, there was a request for $12,000. Yes. And uh, how much did they have within their budget at that time? They had $21,000. Okay, and, and they, they feel their budget to perform this year is going to be in the twenty six to $28,000? They budgeted for 30000 but last year they were able to uh, provide this uh, festival for $27,000. Okay, so we're covering last year's expenses then with this motion. Thank you. Councilor Bessie. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just a, a question to staff. When we allocate uh, grants to various groups and nonprofits, and do we send out a notice to those previous year grant applicants, successful or otherwise? of notification for uh, dates or is that incumbent on the uh, of the agencies to to know or that information on their own your worship mr Cle clemens is here i'll ask him to respond um, thank you your worship uh, there are actually quite a number of different kinds of grants throughout the city a number of different granting organizations all of which have different deadlines so no we don't actually go out and con proactively contact organizations and advise them of what grants are available and what the deadlines are um, may i just follow that up uh, in our uh guides, the activity guides that go to every homeowner, mm -hmm. uh, is there the possibility through Parks and Recreation to uh, have a, a page or a portion dedicated to the manner and the dates and, and the, uh, the manner in which a group would go about you know, where to find out uh, certain information? I, I, it may be helpful to certain agencies or certain groups not to miss deadlines and put, n and now uh, here, we know that it gets delivered to every, I think we do 30,000 of those or thereabouts. So it just might be a way for us to get the information out to the community at large. Just as a suggestion, I don't know if we're doing that now. You know, uh, the, the only concern one is is maybe um, I think it's still important to leave the onus on the applicant to, to make themselves aware of the timelines on these things because there are a huge number of groups involved and I think the logistics of having um, our staff try to monitor them um, and maybe miss a date I really think it's more important to try to leave the responsibility for that with the individual groups but but your points taken and there must be a, a better way to communicate publicly um, the, the deadline and who they can contact for information on it. Thank you, Richard. If I may, I, I would agree with you. I, I do agree with you. I, I'm just so that we don't find ourselves in this position and we know that uh, people would have had access to all of the grant application opportunities and their um, definition of uh, how you qualify or don't qualify and then nobody um, really should f put us in this position yep. where we find ourselves in the 11th hour making a, an, an emergency decision. That, okay. That's all. Good point. Um, Councillor Johnson, you're on again. Did you want to say anything? No? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, Councillor Patchy. Thank you, Worship. To staff, if I may. Um, how much money did the Empire Society receive last year? And was that out of council contingency as well, or was that obtained through the normal procedure? 
Um, Your Worship, as, as I recall, the, it was $12,000 last year and it was paid from council contingency. So this is the second time then that we're going through this proceeding? Oh, no, no, many, many. Many, many? Year after year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I see no further questions. Uh, there's a motion on the floor that's moved and seconded uh, to provide them with $6,000 from the council contingency. On the question, all those in favor? Opposed? We have um, Council Holdem and uh, Council Unger op op opposed. Were you opposed? Sorry. You're in favor or opposed? I, I couldn't see your hand. I'm do you want to whisper? I'm oh. still in the <laughs> I hope somebody out there counted. Anyway, uh, the motion does pass, in, in my opinion. Um, okay, um, we'll move along to um, the staff reports now, ele uh, item 11. Uh, community uh, Safety and Development, 11A, Newcastle and Brecon Hill Neighborhood Plan. Staff recommendation that Council receive the report uh, pertaining to the official community plan amendment bylaw 2011 number 6500.015 which is presented to the bylaw section of the agenda and two um, plan the nimo advisory sorry you want to okay then uh, let's go on the first one uh, uh, your worship i move the staff recommendation as corrected as corrected is there a seconder on that? Moved and seconded. Um, Councillor Apache, did you have anything? I have a, a question. Please, go ahead. Um, I pointed out to Mr. Tucker uh, earlier that um, there was um, a difference between what we read on page 50, um, where it goes to, was it page 50? Uh, let me see, 48. Page 51, sorry, um, where at bullet number one, the last portion of it paragraphs uh, has added as the very last portion, and where the development provides additional amenities. And um, I and some others on this council had a communication earlier today that questioned whether we now are in uh, into the subject of height bonusing as opposed to, to density bonusing. Density bonusing has... Uh, is mentioned in, in the OCP, height bonusing is not. Uh, am I to consider both the same or uh, is this different language? Um, yes, Your Worship. Um, the uh, density for this particular designation, which is the medium high density waterfront designation, is on page 28 of the plan. So the density is set in the plan and it's uh, 50 to 150 plus units per hectare. So the, the density is spelled out in, in one policy. The policy that um, uh, Council uh, gave direction on last time was related to the height and um, the uh, the policy is written was um, in accordance with the uh, uh, direction of council that it would be four stories is what um, would be the um, direction for the plan and then through rezoning on a case-by-case -case basis there'd be additional height uh, considered on that individual basis okay thank you council Holdem. Um, Your Worship, I, I really don't think that last clause is, is contradictory in any way to the uh, motion that Council passed at the last meeting. It, uh, it, it, uh, almost invariably, these uh, developments within this designation would require a rezoning, which would likely trigger the immunity uh, policy, and in this case, we would say it's, uh, that they were to provide additional amenities. So that, that seems to make sense. Okay, Councillor Beswick. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, uh, my questions have, has, have been somewhat um, responded to, but I, I oftentimes um, either misunderstand or get confused when we talk about community contributions versus um, anticipated or expected uh, amenities based on just the baseline uh, with um, developments and rezonings. And when we speak about height bonusing or c community contributions and amenities, and oftentimes, and most recently, we approved one whereby it was uh, planting trees or a, along a highway, and that was considered a community contribution. And 
in in my humblest of opinions, that would be a, a condition of uh, of the beautifying or of, the, of that particular parcel of property uh, in any event. And so I just um, don't know, y yes, they're one-offs and yes, we can negotiate uh, independent of one another. Uh, we had an interesting delegation at our last meeting as it related to land lifts and, and how things are, uh, are um, evaluated in order to provide uh, Consistencies, and we're, we're only talking three properties here in any event, I think. I think that this is only making reference to the three properties. So um, when, I, when I think of community amenities, it, so to me there's the baseline that would be expected under any development, you know, any new development, and then there's when we're making exceptions to provide other uh, increased values to the properties, that there needs to be some um, manner in which we can see milestones or see an easier ability because I'm certain that we, we negotiate these things prior and and part of what we do is we we um, accept on the basis that we secure and we direct staff to secure community contributions that have already been negotiated and so I'd like to know that there's a me almost like a menu Yep, it's a la carte, yeah, it can move around, but I'd like to see that there's some type of menu that we can anticipate, um, and I don't know that that's different than what the gentleman from Vancouver indicated about what the amenities and community contributions and bonusing and land lifting and all those things are um, for Nanaimo. Mr. Swaby, any comments? Comment? And questions. Uh, Your Worship, certainly the uh, plan as it's been drafted uh, provides a, uh, a menu of uh, amenities that the neighborhood would like, but uh, Councillor Beswick's likely, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Beswick talking about uh, what lift in those amenities do we get as, it, as we get different densities that are applied for. And Council has asked staff for a report on amenities and that would come forward later in the year. Uh, and we can provide some options for Council to consider. In the past, the development community has not uh, advocated for that type of approach, and that's something that we'll bring forward for Council to consider, um, having a flexible approach as we currently have, or having a rigid approach that once you meet certain milestones, you provide certain amenities, and uh, you can review that and adjudicate that in, uh, with the report. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the for that response. And so, to to allow some flexibility, and I'm and we are going to see the report. So it'll be great to have the height density and the density density um, combination. And I think that perhaps a hybrid of rigid and uh, ability to uh, not be quite so rigid is likely appropriate. But I look forward to the staff report to include height and density and density density lifting. Okay, Councillor Sherry. Heavy lifting. Oop, heavy lifting. Okay, Councillor Sherry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this has been an interesting exercise because as I go north uh, along Stewart Avenue, we have some what I guess we call filled foreshores yeah. where the, the change of the high water mark has been uh, changed and uh, owners have bought these uh, lots, I believe from the provincial government or the federal government? Provincial. Provincial government. The, the question that I have, under whose jurisdiction do those fall? Who's gonna go, Mr. Tucker? The, um, Filled foreshore, the what is below the high water mark is under the jurisdiction of the Port Authority. And um, on the northern part of the channel, Newcastle Channel, it's under uh, provincial authority. Um, the upland, in other words, above the high water mark, that's uh, jurisdiction of City of Nanaimo in terms of the uh, zoning and uh, uh, planning jurisdictions. Is it is it under the, the new high water mark or is it the old high water mark? Because these are these are filled uh, water filled lot, water, lots. Uh, water lot leases that were filled and that and they have had the opportunity to purchase. Yeah. 
it, it would be under the old high water mark, and those were the maps that were presented uh, with the report uh, at the previous council meeting, showing where the jurisdiction line uh, splits. Okay, because you see, one, one of my uh, concerns as it relates to the, uh, the height is being uh, four stories above Stewart Avenue. And then when we get onto these filled water lot leases or purchases, okay, is that land under the jurisdiction of the city of Nanaimo or under the Port Authority? Same question. I believe, Your Worship, I believe that's the same question and the same answer would apply. And the answer is? Just, just further to that answer is that the city has an agreement with the Port Authority to uh, guide our handling of development applications and, and uh, that, uh, that agreement has a little spreadsheet that uh, allocates whose responsibility various uh, regulatory um, items are between the jurisdictions. Well, I, I, I just want to caution people because we've been, as a municipality, have bitten, been bitten twice one on the, the bistro behind the old federal building or down in the harbor here where the, where the structure was put on piles and there was no need for building permits or anything like that because it was under their authority. And then we go further north down the channel where there's a brokerage outfit that also went into the foreshore and the jurisdiction, we didn't have any jurisdiction over there and uh, you know when we get further down the channel to uh, around the brick and boat ramp and, and there where there is the possibility because these are filled wa water lot lease leases that have been in fact been purchased and that and uh, the question is if uh, do, do we have the, the ability to control uh, those properties from f uh, four stories above Stewart Avenue and because we allow f uh, f for every meter or whatever it is backwards, you're allowing the back of the, the property to be uh, raised that much higher. So these are concerns. I just want to uh, yeah, put, put you on I, I notice there, that there could be problems. I think they're valid concerns, but one thing we know as of right now is that the federal government policy is that the Port Authority is restricted from doing residential development on their properties. So that, uh, I think that provides direction from the senior governments right now. Of course, that could change. You know, I just might want to mention, if we could, that, you know, along the waterfront there, there are either Crown Provincial or Crown Federal water lots, but there are no water lots administered, or owned or controlled by the Port Authority. They entered into a long-term agreement with the federal government to administer federal Crown water lots. They did have for many years a contract with the province which has since expired, and the province is now administering their own. Um, and the province at that point also undertook to decide about, to sell off some of those water lots of theirs, and um, there's a large marina at uh, the north end, I guess maybe the northwest end, that have bought the water lot. So that now it becomes their own property, and, and uh, the jurisdiction, um, I would think, uh, would be... Maybe, Mr. Tucker, do you want to try to get into that when we're talking about a uh, particular marina? Um. The, oh, I thought you were making reference to Sealand Market. Sealand Market's under a 30-year provincial lease, um, as far as I know. Um, I'm thinking of, of Stone's Marina, and uh, Mr. Stone has purchased uh, the filled water lot it, from the province of British uh, Columbia. Free, freehold uh, land. All of it is now. Yeah. And, and I guess maybe Councillor Sherry's question on, on um, restrictions on that building, um, the jurisdiction then would fall with the province, which is sold it out, or to the city of Nanaimo? City of Nanaimo, because it, it's uh, fee simple land, so it's owned by um, Mr. Stones, and, and therefore it would fall within our uh, zoning and, and development approvals processes. Okay. Is that the question you had, or is well, that? I, I just hope that that, in fact, is the is right because I I, I just don't like uh, putting everybody through the hoops 
and then find there is a loophole at the end mm -hmm. at, that they, they can circumvent the system. Because uh, as recently, I've been surprised at what I would call uh, changes of ownership of property, which uh, the city had uh, control of before, but uh, conveniently lost the name from it. That's all. And I, I just raised the flag just for uh, that it's going to be uh, on the radar for special scrutiny. Okay, good point. Councillor Kip. Uh, yeah, Your Worship, I, I would echo um, Councillor Sherry's concern, and I know in the Newcastle Channel area, all our blue on our mapping say in the attachments of previous maps, we don't mark the whole water lot. The water lot actually goes out past our mapping. So I'll, I'll point that out to staff after. But I have a concern too. I mean, the white building, the shed went up at Duke Point, not supposed to have those temporary buildings. So the, I think these restrictions on residential construction will change with economic needs. And if there's only four cruise ships or two cruise ships and they start to need money to run the port, that could change very dra d dramatically. And they've built buildings before and things change. But so that's, I think we're aware of it. On page 53, under the neighborhood monitoring, um, the last bullet, keep the neighborhood plan valid by carrying out an annual review to identify accomplishments and actions still needed or not previously identified. What criteria have we got? Have we used any of those in any other um, plans that we have now? Like neighborhood plans like Stevenson Point, do we have any, or, or the South End neighborhood, do we have any of those monitoring actions? Um, yes, Your Worship, with the uh, Departure Bay Neighbourhood Plan, planning staff meet with the Departure Bay Neighbourhood Association on an annual basis to monitor, monitor issues and items that have arisen in the previous year. Uh, South End Neighbourhood Plan was adopted about four months ago, so we haven't run a full year before we get to a monitoring cycle on that one, but uh, the intent is to keep in contact with the neighbourhood planning uh, groups and to uh, monitor progress towards uh, the plan's vision in each case. Perfect. Oh, so it's just continuing communications. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Patchy. Thank you, Worship. Um, I need to get a little better of a handle on, on what is possible by buying uh, lease land. Now, Councillor Sherry used one example, and I believe you, Your Worship, used another one, Stones Marina. Are those the, the, the two recent examples? Are they the only examples in this particular part of town that we're talking about? Sorry, I think Councillor Sherry also related, referred to the uh, CIBC Wood Gundy building. Oh, say, sorry, I forgot about that. Uh, I think was an example of, of, a, of a development that was uh, managed by the Port Authority. And at that time, there was a dispute with the city about development regulations and, uh, and fees and charges, and that was eventually resolved in court. Okay, and uh, as a follow-up, Your Worship, if I may, if someone uh, who is within the fee simple portion of the waterfront um, wanted to make an attempt to, to buy lease land. Is that a very long, time consuming and uh, other than the money, is it a cumbersome process to go through? To my knowledge, it's not possible in the federal lands. It's not on federal, only no. provincial. No, I, I think the federal, the Port Authority has uh, authority to uh, um, trade lands, but not to dispose of uh, federal properties. Thank you. And it's, it's a huge hodgepodge when you go down Stewart Avenue. An example would be um, Stones Marina was Crown Provincial. Anchorage Marina is Crown Federal. And the two properties are very close together. One's federal, one's provincial. And uh, at the SEPA mill on the waterfront with the location where it was, and when it was uh, constructed, it was constructed on, I think it was five water lots. And I think three were provincial and two were federal or so, just on one building site. So it, it's, it's a very complex issue. It's not... Uh, it's very straightforward. Okay, um, Council, oh, sorry, Council Bestwick, you had one. Thank you, Worship. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think that Council Sherry raises an interesting um, uh, point, and um, Mr. Kenning uh, indicated about residential development on the federal properties, and the the composition of these property build-outs is more than, or, or uh, contemplated to be certainly more than just simply residential, and you did mention one of the properties, the CIBC Wood Gundy building that's on, on uh, pilings and certainly the muddy waters and the property downtown that Harbor Air and the restaurant is in. So it's, I would suspect then it doesn't diminish the opportunity to have more um, of those types of 
uh, commercial properties, if you will, uh, built similar to the ones that we currently see on our waterfront today. Is that what? Is that correct? And is that assumption correct? I, I think there is a potential for that. Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, question on the motion. I see no further questions. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we'll go into uh, the second part, plan and IMO advisory. Oh, sorry, we're gonna go into B. Yep, sorry, into B there. I was reading the wrong line here. Housing agreement bylaw number uh, 7122440, uh, Wakeside Avenue, student housing. Uh, staff recognition of council received the, the report pertaining to a housing agreement bylaw number 7122 with Great West Developments Limited in respect of a 37-bed student housing development at 440 Wakis I Avenue in Nanaimo, which is presented under the bylaw section of the agenda. Move the recommendation second. Move and seconded. Uh, Councillor Padgett, do you have something? Oh, okay, it's all those in favor? Oh, oh you are on, sorry. I didn't, I didn't know if it was a carryover from the last one, I'm sorry. You're on. Uh, not a carryover. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I didn't mean uh, carry on, carry over, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I'm just, um, th there's a two-year, uh, management uh, agreement, housing agreement, to monitor the parking lot for two years. And two years is gonna come and go, and we all already know that parking's uh, a factor in that area has been, and it's been a, um, a contentious issue there in that area. And so I'm just curious as to why the uh, monitoring of the parking lot would only be in effect for two years and not for the period of time that it's um, in perpetuity of being a student housing block. I'm just curious why it's only two years. As you Mr. Were, um, you recall that the student housing is a new use that has been added to our zoning bylaw. Um, it's not a use that was previously contained within the bylaw and the parking ratio for the student housing was uh, based on a variance from our standard residential. So in order to monitor the situation, staff felt it was important to get uh, regular updates of the parking situation to see if that variance was in fact at the right level or whether we can go further reductions or whether we can't go as far in the way of reductions. So we're on a learning curve with this project and uh, it's a way for us to collect data on the actual usage of the parking and be able to amend our bylaws in due course if that's necessary. Mr. Sweeney, go ahead. Yes, Your Worship, and having said that, if Council believes that uh, two years is not in your interest, you could provide direction and we could return uh, after it's amended, after, and we could talk to the owner about amending it to a longer date if you'd like. But could I just ask, Mr. Swaby, if we did have it a two-year uh, program, it could be extended without difficulty, could it not? At the expiration of the two-year period? Uh, your Worship, now would be the time to provide that direction. One longer term? Okay. So, well, Your Worship, um, if the, if they, at the expiration of the two year monitoring of the parking, would that not come back? Would, do we not have the ability to bring that back if there's, uh, if there is complaints or if there's concerns or if there's um, overflow or, or otherwise uh, parking? Um, is there not, do we not have the ability uh, in after 24 months of operations to bring that back? Because it, I, I don't know, so it, in two years, I don't think that, I don't know, I hope the parking problems go away, but they might not. This might add to it, it might reduce it. I don't, I, I'm not sure, but I don't know why we, do, we would put a two year time limit on it. Um, Your Worship, yes. Um, if if it were Council's desire and there there were problems, then certainly the monitoring period could be extended. That would require an amendment bylaw to the housing agreement bylaw, but that's certainly within uh, Council's um, authority. But, but Your Worship, keep in mind that this is just monitoring. The, the use is going to be there, and the parking demand is going to be there. This is information primarily for next time, so that we can learn what is the appropriate level of parking for next time. This zoning is granted. Okay. Well, the, 
I understand that it's a corridor zone and I understand all that, but if this is for next time, then I, I don't know why we would want to put any restrictions on how long we can discuss for next time because I don't know when the next time is and it might be five or ten years from now before there's a next time um, at which time we would have old data to to utilize so when is the next time I don't know when it's going to be uh, two years to me doesn't seem long enough it's just I would I would amend it to re to be five years so that at least we have uh, an opportunity to go through yeah we are receiving it but we still we still want to get some answers information yep so uh, was there an answer on that one just if council wants to make it five years that's that's fine i just wanted to make sure you kept in perspective what that it wouldn't allow you to change the zoning after five years the zoning's there all it, all it is is allows us to collect information for longer in conjunction with uh, them which is fine it's great um, we're happy to do that okay Councilor sherry but the question i have mr chairman i'm in favor of amending this thing <coughs> but it's being brought forward as this is the the agreement now if it's amended uh does this have to come back for another council meeting or uh, is this for final adoption of the agreement or uh, what's the process uh, your worship uh, i'm not aware that we've talked to the owner about the extension to five years and and i would suggest if that's what council wants that we would take it back to the owner and uh, see if they're willing to enter into that agreement and bring it back to council it won't need a, another public hearing but uh, we would want to talk to them about amendment to the uh, housing uh, agreement in particular Okay, because just to remind everyone that uh, what we're doing is receiving a report, so it's not really um, onerous. I mean, we can go back and maybe, Mr. Swaby, if you feel that would be desirable, we can, uh, uh, can staff go back and communicate with him and see if, if the uh, would be applicant is, is right happy with that? We can, we can do that if that's what council uh, um, directs through its motion. Well, let's see what happens here. Yeah. Um, Councilor Sherry, are you still on? Did you want to go? Uh, it's six or one and a half a dozen the other. I mean, it, it, there's been rumbling around that it's coming up as a bylaw later on as part of the agreement. But uh, uh, if that's when you want to deal with it, then that's when we'll deal with it. Okay, Councilor Unger. Just for information, the owner's representative is in the audience tonight, so if councillors have any questions uh, with regard to the owner's intent, uh, that is available to us. Okay, I, don't, I think it'll be council's request as opposed to staff. Councillor Patchy. Thank you, Mr. We are talking here about student housing, which has a total of 121 units, and with the reduced um, parking, there are 145 parks. Sorry? 37 uh, bed student housing. It's um, page three. Okay. Um, so we have student housing, and I, I suspect that most of the students will be um, foreign students. And so I, I really don't see the need for uh, all this extra worry about um, the parking that we're talking about right now. I think most of those uh, residents there will not have cars, and uh, so I'm not concerned about it. Okay. Question on receipt. So, yeah, would someone like to move receipt of the report? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And to uh, C, um, Regional Growth Strategy Amendment Bylaw 1309.01, uh, uh, 2011, in brackets Addison, staff recommendation that council respond to the Regional District of Nanaimo RD and referral of the Regional Growth Strategy RGS Amendment Bylaw 1309.01, 2011, which is 2610 Miles Lake Road, Dash Addison, by resolution indicating the council number one accept the proposed regional growth strategy bylaw amendment or to refuse to accept the proposed regional growth strategy bylaw amended. I move that we accept the proposed uh, amendment. Second the motion. 
Okay, Councilor Bessemer, did you Thank answer? You. Uh, yes, just a question to staff. Could you please um, explain for me then, uh, specifically as it relates to the Addison um, request, but this, by accepting this, what that does? Or if we, if we accept it, sorry. Your Worship, there are several parts to this application uh, of which Council has previously already been referred uh, and dealt with it at the Regional Board. Um, but this is a one lot subdivision that the individual is requesting. This is an application that staff recommended that you not support uh, in the Regional District. Uh, however, uh, it requires that official community plan amendment in the Regional District, uh, Regional Growth Management Plan Amendment, and then it will require a zoning amendment. Uh, given Council's position at the Board um, with the OCP amendment, staff uh, uh, believed it was appropriate to provide you with the option to accept it or refuse it uh, because it was accepted at the Regional Board the last time. Um, so this, this will enable um, the application to amend the Regional Growth Management Plan, finalize the OCP amendment and apply for the rezoning application to allow the subdivision for one lot split. Thank you very much. Okay, Council Oldham. Well, uh, Your Worship, uh, I'm a little bit uh, confused about uh, what staff has just said. Um, it, the, uh, it may have passed at the regional board for the OCP amendment, but uh, did the city, are you saying that the city representatives voted for it, or at least uh, some of us did, or what? Uh, did, did the city actually take a position on that? Uh, Your Worship, the city, the city did take a position on it, and yes, it was unanimous. I believe that uh, the city representatives voted uh, in favor of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councilor Johnstone. Thank you, Your Worship. I'll be speaking in support of accepting the uh, proposed uh, bylaw amendment based on the fact, and uh, unfortunately I was unable to attend the public hearing, but I've read very carefully all the minutes of that meeting and 98% uh, and of the people in attendance at that meeting were in favor of allowing the Addisons to, to subdivide their property for the prime use of, of allowing a member of their family to, to live there. And uh, for that reason, I think uh, I'm certainly supportive of it. And I don't think it's a misnomer. It was a re originally uh, residential, and then it was changed to resort uh, rural. And um, there was some discussion about it going being uh, talked about later, and it never happened. So I, I think it's, uh, in fairness to the Addisons, it's the way to go with this one. Okay, Councilor Kip. Uh, thank you, Worship. I support the motion uh, to bring this property, and it's a bit of an anomaly. It was swept into the r r r resource lands when m and owned it, just because of the ownership. Uh, on page 66, you can see the map in the blue pages where it says subject property, the line from north to south on the page. It was swept in, so it was an anomaly when it was brought into that land. It was an anomaly when our OCP rezoned it because it was a rezoning anomaly. Um, the concerns I have, uh, the staff has concerns and people have concerns that this may open up for that massive amounts of rural, uh, resource land out there. Uh, but I don't think so. I think it's defendable. A lot of what we do is arbitrary. Um, we either hold or fold on a lot of things. I think if the big companies come in, we can hold on the line on the 50 hectare. But I think this is, and they've been very, very patient. I think they've been in the system for six years trying to get this. They've had a site plan and a uh, sort of property layout for a lot of years now, and I think it's time to support this one. How, how, uh, Councilor Gibb, how long have they owned that property? The Addison? They've owned it, I think, for about 12 years, I yeah, think, so like but it was yeah, subdivided long, long before that. Um, Councilor Patchy. Families. Families. Well, um, a question to staff, if I may. You know, obviously this does not support the, the, the fundamentals of the regional growth uh, strategy. And it, quite frankly, I don't know as much about the circumstances that lead some of the colleagues to, uh, to vote the way they do. But if, if this passes, um, is this going to be used as an example for the next time that we do something that is not in harmony with the regional growth strategy? Um, 
speak. Mr. Tech, oh, sorry, Mr. Sweeney, Mr. Sweeney. Sorry. Your Worship, only council can answer that. That would be something that you would have to adjudicate every time an application comes forward. I'm sure an applicant, uh, they tend to remind you of how you uh, have dealt with previous applications, uh, but only council, I think, can answer that. Staff's position where we remain consistent with what we believe the regional growth management plan is trying to tell us about suburban uh, sprawl. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, Council Holder Mira. Uh, Your Worship, I'd like to move an amendment to the motion that's on the floor, which is to accept the proposed RGS bylaw amendment. And the, the addition would be as an anomaly and without prejudice to the general regional growth strategy policy regarding rural lands. Any staff comment? No, Your Worship, uh, the, the intent of that motion is understood. Second the amendment. Okay, but I, I guess my question more is, that is it enforceable when it comes down to question on the next development? Your Worship, of course, just like I answered before, okay. that would be your decision. Same. All righty. Okay. Um, any further questions? Now, there's, uh, Councillor Sherry, was this a question on the amendment? I both I comment on the amendment and uh, that the concern that has been raised uh, in relation to this issue is the amendment, what does it uh, do? You say that I'm, I'm uh, gonna support it, but I, I won't support the next one that's coming down the tube. Okay, we can do that anytime we, we want. The problem is, and the, the thing that we need to understand with this piece of property, Area C did a, a uh, OCP uh, commercial uh, community plan for their area, Area C. And it was fully supported by uh, the Area C residents. The property's been in and out of the resource. It's changed ownership a couple of times and it's back into uh, the Addison family. And if you trace the paper trail long enough, you could see that it was originally owned before the forestry industry uh, got there. So there is that, that long history there. The, the big concern is under the regional growth uh, study for the, the whole district, the regional district, is the matter of the 50 acre minimum parcel size for resource property. This has been less than 50 acres for, I'd say prior to the formation of the Nanaimo Regional District because it hasn't changed there. So uh, to, to put an amendment here, uh, I, I personally can't support it because I don't believe you're you're going to uh, be able to carry any more. Work. We're always subject to to challenge uh, by the forestry companies. Uh, you just take a look at what's happened down in the capital regional district as it uh, relates to the property out the souk and the, uh, that area out there. Thank you, Councillor Oldham. Your Worship, I made the uh, amendment uh, simply to capture uh, what uh, Councillor Kipp was saying, actually. Uh, it, uh, it, the Addisons made a very good case, a very strong case, and a very persistent case at the regional board, going through the sustainability committee and the various uh, planning committees in the region, and then finally to the, to the board table. Um, but the great danger that staff warned us about, both the here and there was that we would be setting a precedent for other applications that would, in this case it's a small application, but that uh, other applications might truly erode the attempt that, the, that we're trying to make in the regional growth strategy to protect the integrity of rural lands. So all I'm trying to do in the motion is to say, yeah, this is a special case. This is one of those exceptions that uh, we as uh, community representatives can make to the 
general rule. But at the same time, we're uh, wanting to make some kind of statement that says we're not setting a precedent here. We're responding to a special case. And that's what the point of the amendment is. Okay, I see no further questions on the item. So first of all, um, on, me, on the amendment rather, all those in favor? Opposed? Um, we have three opposed. Um, sorry, we have uh, Council Greaves and uh, Council Sherry, Council Beswick opposed, balance of Council in favor, so it passes. On the main motion, can all I, those. Can I have sorry? a question on the main motion? Yes, sir. I need to hear it one more time. At the Regional District Board, this was approved unanimously. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, Your Worship, I don't know about unanimous in terms of all the board members. I believe all of our council members voted in favor of it for the OCP amendment that that was uh, that came before this. You'll have to vote on this at the regional board as well. On the main motion, all those all those in favor? Opposed. Councillor Patchy opposed. Council Greaves opposed. I think balance of council is in support. The motion passes. Um, well, uh, the uh, into section D bylaws for abandonment. Um, staff recognition that council received the report pertaining to abandoning the following zoning amendment bylaws, which are presented in the bylaw section of the agenda: zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2003 number 4000.328, zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2006 number 4000.387, zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2009 number 4000.466, and zoning amendment bylaw 2010 number 4. 4,000.483. Receipt of the report. Second. <laughs> Seconded. I see no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, DP 674-775, Terminal Avenue, Staff Recognition Council issued development permit number DP 674 at 775 Terminal Avenue with a parking variance of 56 parking spaces. Anyone like to move that? Move the staff recommendation. Move the staff recommendation. Second. Move and seconded. Uh, discussion? Councilor Bestway. Thank you, Worship. Um, well, I'm certainly uh, strongly in favor of the uh, development of this site and for its intended purpose. Um, and perhaps at the last opportunity that we had to um, express our concerns or even debate them uh, with with more um, with more meat. Uh, I, I have a, a couple of concerns, and a couple of those concerns. Um, is, is in relation to the reduction of 56 parking spaces and what, the, again, what that might do to street parking uh, because the 56 parking spaces that we're eliminating means that guests or visitors coming to this unit, which is relatively significant, and I, again, I'm, I'm happy about it, but there's we're adding a, a set of signalized lights uh, in order to get in there. Uh, we're adding a crosswalk across that extremely um, high traffic road with a, uh, I almost think that we're inviting um, concerns as opposed to eliminating them by putting a set of traffic signals there in a crosswalk along that, uh, across that stretch. Um, and if we are eliminating this many parking stalls, then uh, clearly people are gonna have to park somewhere else, and I assume that it's gonna be on the streets. There's no street parking in front because it's Terminal Avenue, obviously. So I've got, I've got a real concern about the, the safety component coming around what I would consider to be that blind corner before you get to Cyprus, and there's gonna be, uh, I think we're only a couple of hundred yards from the northern intersection set of lights and about 250 yards to the, the other one on Townsite Road. Uh, but it's a, it certainly is a concern for me. I, um, I would much prefer to see a pedestrian overpass or something, and I know that that'll get into costs. I know that that'll enter into the cost thing, uh, but it really concerns me. That's, so parking is one, and the safety with the intersection. I don't think the intersection makes, us, makes it safer. And the other is just the back side of the property or the west side of the property where all the treescape was. And now um, I, I see that to be, I am assuming, just simply a fence, an eight foot high fence on the, on the uh, west side of the, of the massive parking. So again, I, 
I don't know that we have the opportunity here to make any alterations or changes, but the three things that really concern me is the parking reduction to 56 and what becomes a byproduct of that. And now an intersection where we're gonna have three intersections within about five or 600 yards. And the angle of that intersection, I assume it's gonna be an angled intersection, throwing a crosswalk across there to call that a, a pedestrian access way of some yuck. I don't know that that's the, the best place for one uh, on that corner. And um, where's the bus, where's the nearest bus? for people if, if the assumption might be that, well, we'll be encouraging people to um, t take public transit. Um, I, I'm not sure where the nearest bus stop for those uh, people might be. So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about those things, the safety, the, the crosswalk, the parking, that I think are all byproducts of one another. And then off that topic is just simply an eight foot fence, is this, if that's what I understand the landscape component to be on that backside, is just simply a fence. Um, takes away a lot of the uh, vegetation and a lot of the greenery and a lot of the separation with vegetation. So I, um, I, I, I'm gonna support this, this application, but I have some serious concerns about those three items. No staff comment? It doesn't, it doesn't need to be, I'm just asking the question if, the, if there is a staff comment. We can if council wishes. I, I'd like to hear your, sure, go ahead. your reply, yeah, I'd like to hear it. Uh, certainly, and I'll hand it over to Mr. Tucker, changes can be made by council uh, with motions if you'd like to refer it back. Staff is comfortable with the application. Uh, the parking ratio of 1.2, it may seem like a big variance given, but it's a large project. And we have actually smaller and lower parking requirements in the downtown than we do on this property. But 1.2 um, is a reasonable parking requirement uh, based on the traffic study that they provided and the use that's intended. Uh, the landscaping buffer along the ENN railway is as per our bylaw. It's, it's in, there's more than just a fence that's proposed, but it, having said that, it certainly takes away the existing vegetation that separates uh, currently the ENN railway from the uh, property. Uh, and Mr. Tucker, if you have any further comments, uh, no. Um, yeah, it's just further to the um, issue of signalization and the uh, crosswalk on Terminal Avenue. Um, that actually was studied quite extensively by the engineering department and the traffic consultant for the applicant. Initially, what was being proposed was actually an acceleration lane um, uh, out of the property downhill on Terminal Avenue, and it was deemed that that was more likely to cause traffic problems than to have a full signalized intersection. Um, so th there was considerable um, discussion around that. The pedestrian aspect is one of the things coming out of the neighborhood plan, uh, the Brecon Newcastle neighborhood plan, is um, a desire to improve uh, pedestrian connectivity across Terminal Avenue. The Terminal Avenue acts as a, as a bit of a barrier. So by having a signalized intersection, it's increasing the safety of that crossing um, to, al to allow people to do it when traffic is stopped. So, so there was engineering analysis of this and the traffic consultant. And just further to what Mr. Swaby said, the, um, uh, the reduction in the parking was in relation to close proximity to services. It's within walking distance of uh, Terminal Park Mall. There is a bus route on, now I, uh, I can speak for there is a bus stop directly in front of Terminal Park Mall and there is a bus stop just downhill of the Ramada Inn. I'm I'm not sure on this stretch whether there is at the moment, and I can't recall that just off, but there are, those are the two that I'm aware of on either side of this uh, subject property in answer to that question. Thank you, Your Worship, and if I, if I, thank you for the, um, that information. Uh, not unlike Councillor Patchy's question on the previous item, uh, which is relative, uh, which is rhetorical, and so it, is, is the 1.2 might be setting a precedent? So now all of a sudden the 1.2 parking s spaces um, could in fact not be unlike the RGS that we just discussed uh, as well that's 1.2 is the number now um, one for because we're suggesting that 
this is a large project, so 1.2 is the number. Certainly over time, all of these changes become ingrained in people's mind, but we are definitely moving away from providing parking as we encourage people to move out of their vehicles. So this is definitely the trend that we're seeing, and, and we heard from the college that they're on the same tact in, in dealing with their students. Uh, as you I'm not debating this with staff, but of course we have various different units in this property, which I suspect are family units. Um, so we're, this is uh, somewhat different than studios, uh, somewhat different than downtown uh, in a concrete uh, jungle where you, you don't, everything is immediately accessible to you, um, in all likelihood underground to get from uh, you know, point A to B, but there's two bedroom units in here, there's uh, one bedroom units in here, and again, I, I'm, I'm delighted that we're having this property developed, but I'm extremely sensitive to what I think are some safety issues as it relates to uh, what is happening off-site with this project. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kip. Oh yeah, thank you, Your Worship. This is in my ward. Um, it is my neighbor. Um, I have talked to my neighbors about it. There is concern with the reduced parking in the neighborhood that across the tracks into what's not the Brecon neighborhood, they'll be parking and such because of the easy access on Cypress and that. Um, I did thank staff. I mean, it's neat. I went back and actually looked at what we said on the computer in the last meeting. It was interesting. They say, um, and what is a designation? of the railway now. Can staff say it previously was zoned as residential for taxes for the railway company. Is it still now, is it zoned a transportation corridor now? What is the landscape buffer requirements, the level of landscapes required between residential property and that industrial or transportation corridor? Because we have the designations now, do we have a, because I'm believing between the train there should be a reasonable buffer more than a fence. Um, not that it just affects my house and I'll see the apartment in that, but it, it affects the people living in the apartment if there's no sound barrier there. And the um, landscape uh, guidelines set out um, preferred levels of buffering and, uh, and then the designer, the developer, um, produce a landscape plan, as you know, to uh, um, derive what they think is best. This is in an attempt to maximize the parking on the site, quite honestly, where the landscape buffers got reduced um, in order to increase the amount of uh, area for landscaping. Um, there was a desire also to move the building as close to the street so that the parking would be at the rear of the building. Um, so th the, um, it's, it's a series of trade-offs that have arrived at, at the proposed landscaping. Uh, one further, was there ever thought of underground parking? The, the pro proposed project is a rental housing project and it was felt that by providing underground parking that would put the um, monthly rents at a level that wouldn't be uh, affordable housing um, and this is an attempt to provide some rental affordability um, whereas in a, a condo building underground parking the cost is then passed on in the sale of the unit to the, the end user. Further, Your Worship, on the trees. There's a lot of um, old trees on that property, or, or nice trees on that property. And I understand, though, we've de this is the interesting one for me. We have developed this through our guidelines. And I'd like to know what staff needs in the relationship to this type of development variance to ensure that we get indigenous trees, that we keep trees on site. Because, is it right, a uh, question to Mr. Swaby, we talked about this. This has all met the zoning and all met the, the um, landscape and everything where they just come in, knock down every tree, and replant trees. So what does staff need in a situation like to protect more of those, the vegetation on site? Well, Your Worship, I, I believe staff uh, has everything that we need. It, it takes council to come forward and uh, provide a joint value on what you would like to do if you're not happy with the current urban landscaping bylaw that we have. Uh, in particular, I would suggest that the type of trees that are generally found on these older properties aren't appropriate once developments happen because they're they're not usually uh, trees that you would want in a, in a neighborhood. They provide problems with views and, and limbs and that sort of thing. 
thing. So um, I, I, think I disagree. I think those trees are part of the view. <laughs> and <I'm laughs> I, mean, I think the trees are beautiful. It's yeah, stunning. There's a deal. The trees on that side are, are beautiful trees, huge cedars. Um, there's oaks. There's a lot of things on there that are pretty. I, but I know we it's don't have It's a good the discussion. To those. And, and Councillor Kip, on the, who's now part of the uh, Parks, Rec, and Culture uh, Committee, that's where the uh, landscaping bylaw uh, comes from, the tree protection bylaw. And that's certainly something staff can review with you to uh, evaluate whether you would like to make any changes or propose any changes. How old is the tree removal bylaw? Uh, the urban landscape bylaw that's just come forward is uh, maybe one year old. One year? The new urban forest plan? Yes. Yeah, two years old. Okay, thank you. That answers my question. Thank okay, you. Okay, Council Holder. Well, did your worship uh, so just make the comment that uh, the more parking we require, the less landscaping uh, we can have in, in potential anyway, and that we're looking here at 121 units and 145 parking spaces. There are three three-bedroom units and 13 two-bedroom units out of 121, so it's hard to see that we're going to have people renting these units that have a lot of vehicles. Um, unless they have several each. Uh, and, and I see in the uh, general or the specific uh, detailed description of the project that the project is proposed as a rental apartment. So it would seem to me that somebody coming to rent one of those suites would either discover or be told by the manager that there is one or possibly two parking spaces on site, depending on the size of unit that they're renting. And uh, it's, I think, uh, up to the pr person uh, renting the place and the management to make sure that people understand that that's how many parking spaces there are. And if they want a place with more parking spaces, they should probably go somewhere else. Yeah. Um, it's just like buying a house that doesn't have a garage or a driveway. Uh, I mean, you have to be aware of those things when you're, when you're uh, a renter or a buyer and uh, make your choices accordingly. I th you know, I don't think we, I think we go too far sometimes to try to ensure that we're providing for all possibilities uh, rather than leaving some area uh, left for individual responsibility. Okay, Councilor Johnstone. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Holder made most of my points, but 87% was the uh, the percentage of, of one or, or bachelor, one bedroom, or one bedroom with den. So there's there's probably only going to be one car per family, I would think. Uh, plus the fact the developer is providing uh, good trailways and uh, bicycle routes for the for the occupants, and I, I think it, uh, I think he's worked out a pretty good formula. It sounds like a lot, but I'm, I'm convinced it'll be enough. Okay, Councillor Sherry. Uh, to you, Mr. Chairman, to staff, uh, this property is uh, giving up uh, frontage on Terminal Avenue? That's correct. To what depth? Meter, two meters? Uh, I believe it's about seven meters. Four, um, 4 4.5 meters. 4.5 meters. Yes. 4.5. 4, 4 so if, if we, and that's a, a requirement I would imagine from the Department of Highways or the City of the Nanaimo? The City. Okay, to, to bring that uh, Terminal Avenue and that section up to uh, uh, an engineer's uh, width? That's correct. Okay, so when we start talking about uh, putting in the signalization of the lights and that, then uh, uh, when we get the walk across, uh, will it be the same distance uh, if we go up to St. George Street and Terminal Avenue uh, between the resident, the railway tracks and the service station? Is that about the same width uh, uh, for the cross section? Likely a little bit less, Your Worship, uh, given that there's two left turn uh, movements at the intersection that Councillor Sherry's talking about. Um, so this is likely a little bit less. Okay, I'm just thinking about when the traffic lights and we get the walk, uh, they're coming out uh, and making the, the turning movements and that. So if they've uh, four plus meters uh, moving back, if we didn't require that, then there would be plenty of space for 
uh, the additional part. Um, well, we have two more. Councilor Kim. Um, if you determine that they're giving out one space and designated spaces and that's it, and we have to be responsible, do you think then people would move out onto the street to park? <coughs> or the guests would park out in the street? And that's, I guess, one of the concerns of the neighborhood. Although I don't want to see more parking in this, I absolutely don't. But I also want to make sure it doesn't move into the area around it. I mean, that's the thing because they can't park. Now, one interesting one on this lit intersection. <coughs> It's going to be a closed from 3 o'clock till 6 o'clock left-hand turn coming out of town, isn't it? Uh, I would imagine so. Yeah. Same as the town site intersection? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be the same. So that's going to be an interesting one when people are turning left at 4 o'clock coming around that corner when people are coming south on that road because it's a busy one. Now, the other side, is there any room for a bus pull out there? The closest bus is down by the Grand Hotel. The next one is up, and there's one on Town Site Road. There's a bus stop on Townsite Road, too, and I, I think, think on St. George. The Ramada, uh, I think you mean. Well, no, on Townsite Road, uh, by the 7-Eleven. Uh, the there's one right there, too, on either side of the street there. So there is buses, but boy, this is because there's apartments across the street now in Cyprus, the one we did with Jeff's construction all down there. So it's a very dense area, and it would be neat to see if there could be some form of bus allocation in there somewhere, but I know it's pretty late into the project to ask for that. Thank you. Just as a thought, um, if they're going to dedicate uh, 4.5 meters, could that piece be used as a bus pull-off until such time as the road is widened? Not now. Uh, Your Worship, we'll, we'll discuss with transit the possibility of uh, of a transit exchange uh, or sorry, a, a, a bus stop at this location. Right. I highly doubt that it would be available given the safety yeah. issues that we've dealt with. Here. Okay, we have the last question, Councillor Bassway. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, is a 4.5 meter setback, if you will, to accommodate another lane of vehicular traffic, or is it to, uh, for the sidewalk, for pedestrian traffic, and then what happens on the southern side of that property? Uh, does it, does the sidewalk change and remain, join, what happens? Your Worship, it's for all of the above, but it's basically for future uh, use as we, uh, as the highway potentially gets widened. This is the narrowest part of the highway as it runs through the city. So this will accommodate the, all of the things that we talked about for safety uh, to accommodate the intersection, the, the sidewalk. But there's no, there's no other lane because there's no other lanes that it would join into. Uh, it's just to widen in this uh, particular location. So the, it remains a four lane with a sidewalk? That's correct. And where do, uh, on the south end of that property, of the development, what, what happens to the sidewalk? Uh, Your Worship, it would rejoin the existing sidewalk. Okay, I'm, I didn't realize that there was an existing sidewalk. I, there's an existing asphalt sidewalk, albeit very narrow, on this uh, section of the highway, and, uh, which is interrupted considerably by the power poles as you go down. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. I think um, it's time to vote on this thing. I, I think this is an extremely important project for Nanaimo. It's uh, going to be built on property that's been derelict and, and virtually abandoned since, I guess, almost since Haig Burns lived there. and. Uh, um, it's, it suits, mm -hmm. it suits um, the low barrier, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, low income housing rather, Freudian slip, and um, the, um, w I think this is something that we really want to encourage. So uh, having said that, a question on the motion, all those in favor? Opposed? Um, okay, it's unanimous, it passes. Uh, we'll go into uh, the uh, property maintenance bylaw 1993-704 uh, has been pulled, so we're going to go down to, into the uh, 2011 acting mayor schedule um, and staff recommendation the council adopt the uh, amended acting mayor schedule as follows, and it lists uh, the various councillors and, um, and the dates applicable. I don't know that, to, uh, Ms. Harrison, is it necessary to read them, do you think? No, I don't think it's necessary. We're just adding councillor Green in for the October 24th to December 4th, 2011 spot okay. that was current, previously vacant. Is there any second to do? S second amending the schedule as, as uh, amended. That's what the motion was? Yes. Uh, the, the motion is that council adopt the amended acting mayor schedule as follows. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed?
Are you what's that? Um, the RDN alternate director appointment schedule, staff recognition that Council 1 appoint Council Greaves um, as an alternate director to the Regional District of Nanaimo Board, and 2 adopt the Regional District uh, of Nanaimo alternate director schedule for 2011 as follows. And this is the one where um, Councillor Greaves has been put in uh, for the month of May, the month of July, the month of September, and the month of November, alternating with Councillor Patchy um, uh, for the alternate uh, dates in there. So having the recommendations moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. We're moving the Regional District of Nanaimo Pump and Hall Local Service Amendment Bylaw Number 975.54, um, and that's uh, comma 2011. Staff recognition of Council waived the consent requirements under Section 801.4 of the Local Government Act by consenting to the adoption of the Regional District of Nanaimo Pump and Hall Local Service Amendment Bylaw Number 975.54, 2000. 11, and that the regional district of Nanaimo be notified accordingly. So moved. Seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, regional district of Nanaimo Parks, sorry, regional district of Nanaimo Regional Parks and Trail Service Loan Authorization Bylaw 1628, 2011. Staff recommendation that Council waive the consent requirements under Section 801.4 of the Local Government Act by consenting to the adoption of regional district of Nanaimo Regional Parks and Trail Service Loan Authorization Bylaw. Uh, number 1628, 2011, and that the Regional District of Nanaimo be notified accordingly. So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, request for proposal number 1133, SAP Basis and Technical Support Services Report. Um, staff recognition at Council Award Request for Proposal RFP number 1133 uh, for the City of Nanaimo's SAP and Technical Support Services to, to group basis in the amount of $7,500 per month for a three year term. Uh, would someone like to move and second it, and then we have a uh, discussion on that thing? Second it. Um, uh, for discussion, we have Councillor Beswick. Thank you, Worship. Um, so, this uh, award is uh, on an annual basis is less than the previous uh, companies, the company that um, was handling this service. And much of the uh, savings will be in additional costs over and above, um, I, I'm assuming baseline services. That's how we got to the uh, 300,000 plus dollar uh, annually. So it's, is, is this a case where the $7,500 monthly um, may have significant cost pluses? Uh, your, your Worship, um, in response to Councillor Beswick, um, we're currently paying about $9,500 a month for the same service from the current provider. We tendered it, and the cost has now come, come in at $7,500. So we will be actually saving money under the new contract. And we'll be saving $24,000 a year. Yes, yeah, so thank you. So, and this, the contract is uh, similar to or identical, so that this, we're, we're receiving the same. Um, we're receiving the same amount of work, the same, everything is covered off the same? We're, we're, actually, receiving, we're actually receiving more work for, for, for less, less cost. And before we were paying, under the old uh, provider, we're actually paying $8,000 a month, another $1,500 for added work. All that added work is now included in the 7,500. So yes, we are receiving the, the same equivalent service. We're receiving more for less. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. What a miracle. Yeah. What a concept. <laughs> Great. Thanks. In this day of age. Okay. Um, question on the motion. Um, all those in favor? Oppose? It carries information items only. Report uh, for Mr. J. Home Manager Planning Re LA 63 Entertainment Endorsement for a Food Primary Liquor License, the Mix Restaurant at 2220 Bowen Road. If somebody would like to uh, the information item, okay, move and second it. All those in favor? Opposed? Any um, reconsideration of bylaws? And to be moved by Acting Mayor, Councillor Holdem. Councillor Holdem. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that uh, zoning bylaw, amendment bylaw 2003, number 4000.328, to add a floor area, area ratio limit to the single family residential island RS4 zone on Protection Island be abandoned. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 
And I move that zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2006, number 4000.387, RA130, a site specific text amendment to the mixed use commercial C4 zone to include parking lots as a permitted use at 3054 and 3058 Barons Road be abandoned. Second, the motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I move that zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2009, number 4000.462, RA217, to add a site specific use of boat and marine equipment sales, services, and rentals to the light industrial I2 zone for 1910 and 1920 East Wellington Road be adopted. Second, motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And I move that zoning bylaw amendment bylaw 2009, number 4000.466, RA228, to rezone. 5876 Shadow Mountain Road from single family residential zone RS1 to residential triplex and quadruplex zone RM2 in order to accommodate a triplex on the lot be abandoned. Second, the motion. Moved and All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Lots of housekeeping here, Your Worship. Yeah. I move that uh, zoning amendment bylaw 2010, number 4000.483, RA249, to rezone part of 314 Benson View Boulevard from single family mobile home residential zone RS3 to residential duplex zone RM1 in order to facilitate subdivision and development of a duplex lot be abandoned. Second motion. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I move that uh, zoning amendment bylaw 2010, number 4000.488, RA252, to rezone part of 5547 Noy Road from single family residential zone RS1 to residential duplex zone RM1 and residential triplex and quadruplex zone RM2 in order to include additional density within an approved subdivision be adopted. Second motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. And finally, I move that zoning amendment bylaw 2010. 10, number 4000.492 RA246 to rezone 730 Sterling Avenue from single family residential zone RS1A to residential triplex and quadruplex zone RM2 in order to facilitate construction of multifamily dwellings, four units, be adopted. Second, Second the motion okay. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Um, introduction to bylaws. <coughs> okay. Uh, I move that uh, housing agreement bylaw 2011, number 7122 for student housing development at 440 Wakasaya Avenue past first reading. Second, second. Moved and seconded. Uh, I see no discussion. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And I move that housing agreement bylaw 2011 number 7122 past second reading. Second motion. Moved and seconded. Um, no questions. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. And this is as printed, right, Your Worship? Okay. I move that housing agreement bylaw 2011 number 7122 past third reading. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Introduction of development bylaws. Yes, Your Worship. I move that official community plan amendment bylaw 2011 number 6500.015 to include the Newcastle and Brecon neighborhood plan within the official community pa plan past first reading. Second motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. And I move that the same amendment bylaw pass second reading. Second motion. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay. Is there a seconder? Second. They do that each day. <laughs> Mr. Greaves, I want you to know this is what happens. They turn on you so quickly. You know, that <laughs> they, they wait till the end of a meeting and then they beat me up. It's terrible. Um, we're going right down into the uh, question period because if someone wants to point out to me that uh, delegations are already done. Um, on uh, item 21, question period, agenda items only. Mr. Taylor. Keeping in mind in speaking to council in the past uh, during financial uh, bylaw matters and hopefully seeing our tax dollars go to uh, citywide uh, advertisement in the news media instead of uh, a very low circulation, uh, which I see is still happening. Um, what about the use of city page? and different departments, which I've asked for in the past, to have a turn at putting something on the city page and what comes to mind is deadline for grants or anything else that's important like uh, 
over GVW trucks on residential streets or containers on residential properties or whatever comes, uh, different departments must have little ideas that it could go on a, a little spot on that city page instead of worrying about in brochures to Parks and Rec or whatever. What agenda item is this, Where was this on the agenda? There was a question about the Empire Days. Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> well done, actually. <laughs> uh, I've spoken to this council many a times about uh, invasive weeds and i.e. broom on city properties and I'm going to name the corner of Wakeside and Bowen again which nothing's been done about and we've had staff sitting here saying oh yeah they'll get groups to clear it up even on that property which is city owned is a pile of uh, uh, cuttings and everything put there by the left there by the city department which fire department has gone after people around the new uh, rice, ice arena on third street for a fire hazard yeah the city can pilot it in amongst the residential area in the center of that lot as well as all this broom and yet it remains and seeds the rest of the neighborhood in Bowen Park. And well, actually, um, uh, Councilor Johnstone and I were talking about this, and uh, the suggestion was made we should canvas that area for volunteers that live nearby that could help us with that pro Oh, Garner Crescent? Was, I'm sorry, I missed the address when you were here before that. Garner Wakes I am Bowen. Oh, that's uh, that site. Okay. That's a city yeah. lot owned by the city. Okay. And my last question, uh, could the uh, council ask for a report in regards to what happens to leased areas from the province on our waterfront when a property owner buys them, whether it remains under the jurisdiction of the province, that area, or comes to the city? Because there seems to be some differences of opinion on that subject, uh, and also um, where the federal and provincial boundaries are because I believe it's Newcastle uh, Marina is the boundary for between federal and provincial and it would sa satisfy a very valid question that Mr. or Councillor Sherry raises because it could affect your Newcastle plan considerably a uh, surprise to you if they end up owning the, the property as fee simple and out of the lease area and jurisdiction of the province. So yeah, that the point. council asked for a report dealing with integrated land management as to where the lease area goes when they